is Lord. And we are in an age of untruth. Do you remember the Jeffrey Epstein story? where the high-profile pedophile and heinous predator was supposedly killed by suicide there in a high-profile prison? You know, all throughout our institutions, the official narrative was, yes, indeed, he did commit suicide, while rational people would look at that story and say, this is kind of unbelievable. Well, guess what? Guards have now come forth admitting they lied about his death. There is now evidence that's out in the public sphere admitting that, yes, indeed, the narrative that it was suicide is a bit of a fraud. We can now confirm that if you suspected you were being lied to, that is indeed true. You were being lied to. Now, I'm not someone who is in the business of collective justice, but when all the individuals in the mainstream media, they are on record, you know, they're literally caught on tape going along, willfully going along with a preposterous lie, then it's actually fairly safe to say that that entire industry is a fraud. And you know, when all of our institutions want to go along with industries that are frauds, then it kind of cripples their reputation as well. And what we need to understand that is that in the hour in which we live, this time for which we have been called, this time for which we have been chosen, all of our institutions, including those which are supposedly Christian, are infected by the same spirit which would promulgate such a preposterous lie as that of Jeffrey Epstein killing himself. So what we need to do as we need to understand that you as an individual, you're going to have to work out your faith in fear and trembling because there is no one, no one who will stand for you on the day of evil. You have to find courage. You need to start with the premise and assume that you are being lied to. Even someone like me, a pastor here on the other side of the internet, assume you are being lied to. Work out your faith in fear and trembling. God alone makes the good. There are no exceptions to that. And we are fallen creatures in a fallen world. Now, we look at those things and we might realize we need an antidote. We don't want to live in untruth. God did not design us to live in untruth. If you are in the church, and again, when I say we don't want to live in untruth, there actually are a lot of people who are non-believers who really do want to live in untruth. You remember that song back from the 80s, you know, sweet dreams are made of this. Well, the lines in there, some of them want to to use you. Some of them want to be used by you. Some of them want to abuse you. Some of them want to be abused. That is actually true. When Moses takes the people out of the promised land, there are a lot who want to go back to the tyranny in Egypt. There are people who want to bow down. And this last year, with everything that happened with the coronavirus, we should realize there are people who do want a tyrannical overlord, a wrathful God to come and dictate to them how to live every aspect of their life, and they want you to be slaves as well. This is actually a reality that we must realize. We are fallen creatures. Now, once we come into the church, we say, well, God didn't make us to live in untruth. We're saved. We want to be moving away from untruth. We want an antidote. There must be something which pulls our society to a better place. We need something that gives us discernment, something that means we as individuals, regardless of what expertise, what experience we have, something to aid us so that we will not fall for scams. We need an antidote that says, well, no one else is going to stand with me and have courage, so I need something that will make sure I have the backbone to stand with certainty. And guess what? You know, I've got on my red for Pentecost, and the shirt says, the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We have that antidote. And God alone makes the good. And guess what? God the Holy Spirit came to us on the day of Pentecost. Holiness is the answer. Holiness is the antidote to chaos. All of it. All of it. Holiness is the antidote to chaos. And that's whether it be the chaos of untruth promulgated across the airwaves, chaos to the, the debauchery that might creep into your own life as a temptation. It's the antidote to the chaos which comes into your life where family members get into it with one another over, their, over petty things which don't ultimately matter. Even with sickness and, you know, things which come to afflict our body, the holiness of God did not design us to be sick. You look there in the, the temple, the Holy of Holies. One could not approach the holy places of God if they were unclean or if they had things which took their body away from the design which God had it. Why? Because the holiness of God cannot tolerate things which deviate from his design. But you know what? God desires that none of us fall into condemnation, but instead that all come to repentance. The holiness of God, the Holy Spirit came to you that you might be once again sufficient to stand. You, you as an individual. You know, we look there at the fires of Pentecost, and we're going to read Acts 2 here in a moment. The fire of Pentecost, it brings good news. 
because the lost children of Eden can once again be sufficient to stand with God. When the Holy Spirit comes to us in its fullness, we can live with clear minds. We can stand firm in truth and holiness. And my, oh my, how our world needs that right now. Let us not be confused. Holiness is a beautiful thing. It is the antidote to the evil which infects and mangles every aspect of life. The Holy Spirit came that we might not be passive, that we might stand firm in contending for the gospel of Christ Jesus. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other path to goodness and truth except through Him. Holiness is the antidote. It's beautiful. Grab it. Let the lion out of its cage. I want us to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, we find teachings about the doctrines of demons, the didascalias daimonion. And particularly, I want us to look at 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. And this scripture reads as follows, and it's very particular. It says, The Spirit expressly states that in the latter times people will renounce the faith. Now let me just take a moment and explain this. This is my own translation of this passage. But whatever translation you have of it, grab your Bible, read it. You don't have to be someone who, who can do translating work or you don't have to be clergy or anything. Grab your scriptures, read them. Whatever translation of the Bible you have, read scripture. Do it. Well, this passage, it says, The Spirit expressly states that in the latter times people will renounce the faith. Meaning, what we have here is a form of apostasy. There are people, not unbelievers who never knew God, but people who in full consciousness, they knew God, they were a part of the faith, they confessed that Christ was Lord. And then, in full consciousness, not people who were deceived, not people who were led astray, they willfully renounced their faith. They willfully cast it aside. They are wantons. You know, Jude talks about those who have stolen in among you. They have perverted the grace of our God into licentiousness. That is exactly what we get right here in 1 Timothy. People who willfully looked at the gospel and said, You know what? God, everything that's good, true, and beautiful, I'm going to throw that aside. Why? Because, picking back in our first, up in our verse, giving heed to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. I threw away my faith because I wanted to listen. I wanted to compromise. I wanted unity with the deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Now, what happens when this, this comes along? You get untruths spoken in hypocrisy by those who have been seared in their own consciousness. Now, let me just go back. I want to read these two verses together because I know I, I preached a lot in between them. The Spirit expressly states that in the latter times, people will renounce the faith, giving heed to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons, and in untruth, the speaking hypocrisy, by those who have been seared in their own consciousness. So what we find here are the doctrines of demons. And chief among the doctrines of demons is the concept of untruths. Now, the ancient world had a lot of different ways they described bearing false witness, lies, and things of that nature. But the particular word we have right here is pseudo-logos, and that's a Greek compound word. Pseudo means fake. Logos is where we get the idea of logic, order, reason, word. You know, Christ himself, in the beginning was the word, in our K and halagos, logos word. You know, this is a term, the pseudo-logos. I know we often translate it as lies, but it quite literally means fake words. It is an untruth, a fake reason. And that's where we are. We are in the era of untruths, fake words, the age of unreason. Every aspect of society around us is being viciously ripped apart by untruths. And it's a very, very serious problem with which we must contend. God did not create Adam and Eve to live in untruth. Nor did Christ create the church that we would sit idle and let the world around us rot in the chaos of insanity. It's not good that the church is, is losing influence in the world around us because that means there are more and more people who are not coming to know Christ Jesus. It is negligent on our behalf to be passive while paganism, heathenism, they all grow. We have to understand Christianity is not the only one contending for souls. Hell likes security of souls. We're not the only belief system that's out there doing evangelism. Oh yeah, the world does its evangelism too. All the pagan belief systems, all the stuff which does love collective justice. The stuff which loves tribalism, relativism, subjectivism, the things which love untruth. All of this stuff, it is a religion. It's a belief system. 
You can look at something like abortion. The same arguments are made as the people who sacrifice their children to Molech. You know, I need to advance my career. I need to make sure I have crops next year. So I've got to sacrifice my child in order to do that. It's all the same arguments. The idea that says, well, you know, that group of people, they've had this history behind them, so we don't hold them accountable because they've been disproportionately affected by, you know, something. And this group over here has been disproportionately blessed by something. So we're going to change things around to make sure things are equal. Guess what? If you believe that, the first century called, they want your tribalism back. They want your paganism back because that's how people lived and they believed. In Egypt, the Egyptians have had this, so we treat them this way. You know, we've got the people over here who go to the Temple of Diana. They worship there. We, we have all these different belief systems, different ways of accountability, different levels of citizenship for all the different tribes. Guess what? You're a heathen. You're a pagan if you believe that. God comes to us and says, no matter where you're at, Man, woman, free or slave, you all need to be saved. You're all fallen creatures and you will all come before the throne of judgment and you will all be measured against Christ Jesus. Period. I don't care whether you had one talent, five talents, you will be given the same measuring stick against you. So what we need to do and I know that my, my message sounds quite severe, but what I want us to understand is that we in the church, we need to be mature and we need to quit being passive and toying with evil things. We need to quit flirting with the doctrines of demons. In our world right now, we have a lot of things that demand unity. I actually put up a post today. Unity for unity's sake means nothing. It's not a virtue. And if you enter into your terms, you say, well, I, I want to go out and minister to people, but unity is going to be up there at the top, then you're, you're going to find yourself in hell. There's a cage in hell with your name on it. You know why? Because if you put in your terms, I want unity at all costs, well, then all sorts of wicked ideas are going to be slipped in there. You're going to be bowing down to golden statues. You will willfully take your hands and give room for the idols, the totems, the Asherah poles, the, the statues of, of Baal and Molech. You will build them because in order to achieve unity, the forces of evil will demand you go along with certain things. If you actually want to be people of the gospel, then we're going to have to cast some stuff out. And you know what's strange? Is that mature love understands if you have a child who won't eat, it is bad parenting to say, okay, child, we'll take away the food and let you starve to death. That's not love. When people desire evil, it's not love to say, okay, we're just going to let you desire evil and we're not going to correct you. Mature love says, you know what? It's going to be kind of gross and icky to cast out the demons in your town there at the Gadarean region, but we're going to do it anyway. You might ask us to leave because it makes an ugly scene to cast out the evil, but it actually needs to be done. By the grace of God, Jesus was willing to do stuff that did in fact cause disunity in the world. Jesus was willing to do stuff because he was mature enough to assert what was good and true because he knew that the world needed that more than it needed the, the passivity and the idleness that it deserved. So let us not make ourselves passive. You know, we look around our whole, our whole world right now. You know, healthy and whole creatures do not live in untruth. God made us to be healthy and whole. I love the language there in, in Paradise Lost. I created man with all he could have wanted, just and whole. You know, healthy and whole creatures, they do not desire to live in sin and chaos. But yet, many people around us do. Healthy and whole creatures do not desire passivity and destruction. But yet there are many people who desire passivity and they want to destroy their own body to make themselves against what God created them to be. Healthy and whole creatures do not fester in confusion, but yet there are many of us, many who are even leaders in the church who are just racked with uncertainty and confusion. God did not make us to live like that and the Holy Spirit did not come on Pentecost so that you would live in confusion. Healthy and whole creatures do not reject natural law and deny reality, but yet the sons of Adam, the daughters of Eve, the lost children of Eden have desired this since the fall. But yet the world is not without hope because Christ has come that we might be redeemed and the Holy Spirit might come that we would once again stand against the wiles of evil. So today there's a lot of layers to this message. 
We must not make ourselves passive and ignore the extremity of untruth in our society. We live in an age where people are, in, are encouraged to embrace their naturally felt desires. Regardless of how insane that naturally felt desire might be, people are encouraged to do that. People are encouraged to become ingrates. You know, people who don't have any gratitude, that's what an ingrate is, someone without gratitude, an ingrate. People are encouraged to be ingrates against their parents, against any blessings which have brought them to the moment in which we live. You know, God gives us so many blessings in life. Day by day, many we, we overlook. Even the very breath of life is a blessing that people are ungrateful for. We live in an age of unreason, where people insist that things are out there simply because they demand them to be. And they believe that the world would be a utopia if we simply tear down the restraints against sin. If we took away all standards in society, then suddenly we would have a fantastic world where everybody is in peace and harmony. It is not true. If you believe that will be true, then there is a cage in hell with your name on it. And I, I say that because I love you enough that I want you to turn from that. And if you know people in your life that are very resistant to truth, we have to be mature enough in our faith that say, Despite your resistance to truth, I am declaring it to you for your own good. We live in an age where truth is ignored, ignored, not even debated, but ignored to the point of annihilation. And the doctrines of demons, which we find there in 1 Timothy 4, they run amok without any accountability. You know, one of the things which is amazing about that Jeffrey Epstein story is the guards came forth because they knew there would be no accountability. They knew there would be no consequences. People do hoaxes and scams all the time. And it's not, by the way, the scam caller who just calls you on the phone. That happens a lot too. And those are scams which need accountability. But we're at a point now where the people who run our institutions are the ones running the scams. All of them. We have been so passive, we have desired unity over truth so long that all, all of our institutions have been worked over by the spirit of 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, which says, The idolatrous God of this age is blinding the minds of unbelievers to negate the radiating illumination of the glory of the gospel of Christ Jesus. That spirit, that idolatrous evil, it has overrun all of our institutions, all of them. God alone makes the good. There's no magic rule that says that it won't happen. We've gotten things out of order. Unity can be good, but only when it's a just reward for the, the contention we've had for all that is actually good, all the principles, the virtues, the truth. So today, we've got a lot of scripture I want us to get through, and I know I've already preached for a while, but we're, we're getting closer to the end of our message because God has been working throughout time to give us an antidote. You know, what is self-awareness but an attempt to look at where we are and compare ourselves to where we should be? You know, a healthy and whole creature says, I am a fallen creature, but look at Christ Jesus. That's where I should be. We're in an age now where people don't think they should compare themselves with something more perfect than themselves because we've bought into this lie that says you are perfect as you are. You are perfect in your naturally felt desire. You know, in the church, we've confused the fact that all life, all children are inherently valuable with the idea that they are perfect in their sin. Like that's that's a ridiculous confusion to happen, but yet we've done it. What happens when the whole generation believes they're perfect in their naturally felt desire? Well, that generation becomes wantons who desire hell. They become wantons. But the Christian faith calls us to something greater. And throughout scripture, Jesus is working to bring us something greater. I want us to go to Mark chapter 14 and see how when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, there is some, there's a, a movement happening in Scripture. There's a, a direction, a goal. It's not movement for the sake of movement, but Jesus is moving towards salvation where people can be redeemed. And not only will you be redeemed where you're not condemned, but also you will be sufficient to stand where you can be someone who is not withering away in the wiles of evil and untruth. Well, in Mark 14... The people come together, and people, I mean the disciples, they, they come together with Jesus for the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to begin in Mark 14, verses 17, and read all the way to 28. It says, When evening came, he arrived with the twelve, and they were reclining and eating, and Jesus said, I assure you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. 
And they began to be distressed and say to him one by one, Surely not I. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, the one who is dipping bread with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man that he had not been born. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and so they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many. I assure you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in the kingdom of God. After singing psalms, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will run away, because it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been resurrected, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now what we find here is, Jesus is acknowledging the state of humanity, the state of the fall. But he's also acknowledging that work is being done to to remedy this and to give an antidote to it. One of the things I think is beautiful about this is the disciples actually have some amount of self-awareness. As Jesus prepares to institute the Lord's Supper, he makes them aware that one will betray him. And interestingly, they examine themselves. And in Mark 14, 19, each reads... Or the scripture reads, it says, They began to be distressed and say to him one by one, Surely not I. You know, each thought it was unlikely that they would be the traitor, but they were at least willing to contemplate the notion. They acknowledged they were capable of sin. And they included in that contemplation that they were capable of such a heinous deed of of rejecting Jesus. Now, Peter, he feels very certain that it won't be him. You know, he comes to the Lord and says, Oh, Lord, not I. But his feelings about the matter do not change the fact that within a day he would do that very sin. You know, we are a lot more complicated than we are self-aware, and our feelings about the world around us are often very, very wrong. But by the grace of God, the disciples remember their fallen creatures. And while it actually is very essential that we acknowledge that we are fallen creatures, you know that is important to rational thinking, doing that is not enough to actually save people or stop them from their rebellion. But yet God's grace is active in all this. And this is where we really come to the table with critical thinking and we're putting things in order. One of the very important things to rational thought is starting with the premise that you are a fallen creature and God alone makes the good. Now, if you get part of that and you say, well, I'm a fallen creature, that's not enough to save you or to sanctify you, but it is an important step in critical thinking. You know, the scientific method begins with stating the problem, but just accomplishing that task doesn't actually solve whatever problem you're trying to address. You know, it's much easier to notice an illness than it is to come up with an antidote to it. And while the disciples are good at reflecting on their inadequacies, they still need something more to transform them, to really help them understand the world on a much deeper level. And by the merciful love of God, that path for redemption and holiness was paid for them. Because Jesus, he would go to that cross, he would die and resurrect. Not a creed, not a philosophy, a fact. Jesus resurrected. That must be contended with. And after resurrecting, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2 reads, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, like a noise... A violent rushing wind it came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and a tongue rested on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues, as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. I love this, because now not only are the disciples saved. Not only are they redeemed, they're no longer in the state of eternal death, but they now were sufficient to stand. No more would Peter be denying Jesus, but instead he would be so true to the Lord that he would endure a martyr's death for his faith. No more is the church going to be scammed by ridiculous and preposterous lies, but instead they have discernment. With the Holy Spirit's fire on Pentecost, All, all in the church can be made sufficient to stand. All, all. With the coming of the Holy Spirit 
comes the beautiful antidote to mankind's insanity. Let us not be confused. Holiness is the antidote to the insanity of the world. Holiness is the antidote. It is tragic when people are taught to embrace their natural felt desires. It is not compassion. It is not. One of the things the devil has gotten really good at is painting things as being compassionate that are not compassionate. For despite something like, you know, you're fine just like you are, you're beautiful like you are, despite that sounding compassionate and loving, it is in fact a ravenous teaching which only leads to chaos. It's like a parent who's telling their child, it's okay that you don't want to eat, we'll never make you eat again. That is what it is. We have forgotten what holiness is, the beauty of its call, and thus we have caged the lion of our victory. I'm a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene. I'm ordained by it, but I'm not sanctified by it. The Holy Spirit alone sanctifies people. I'm not any better than anyone out there if they're a lay person um, or even another clergy. I'm, I'm no better because of whatever credentials, whatever biography I have. The only thing that can make me better, the only thing that can make you better, is the blood of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the goodness of God which spoke together the heavens and the earth. Nothing else on this earth will make you better. Nothing. Not a thing. It's repulsive. We now live in a world where many of our denominations are far more concerned with biographies than they are truth. They're concerned with unity more so than they are truth. And guess what? If you desire unity over truth, you will get neither because you deserve neither. You have earned all the chaos you are now reaping. An article came out about how wokeism and things like social justice have infected the church and they're causing a lot of civil wars within Protestant denominations. All the people who sat by passive and they put out the platitudes about unity and togetherness, you have earned the civil war that is coming for you because you desired it. In Acts chapter 13, there are two men who are in front of Paul. One of them's name is Elymas. He's a false teacher, a sorcerer. He is here to corrupt the gospel. Next to him is Sergius Paulus, the Roman proconsul, who has inquired for Paul and Barnabas to come because he wants to hear the gospel. Paul looks at the two of these men and says, Elymas, you are the son of the devil. Get out. You will be blind. And then he looks to Sergius Paulus and preaches the gospel to him. In our modern world, people have chosen Elymas. They want the approval of the people who ate truth, and they've done so at the loss of those who are earnestly hunger for it. Those who earnestly hunger for the gospel have been forsaken by leaders who would rather compromise and align themselves with the world because it sounds nice and it feels good to be unified. The civil war that is coming within the denominations is earned. Own it. If you ever asserted unity, if you ever asserted that if we want to find truth, then we just need to get all the voices at the table rather than looking to the Holy Spirit of God, you earned the chaos that is coming. You earned it. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. You want to be certain? You want to stand true? That is what you need. Let's go down to Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21, where Peter, no longer denying Jesus, he preaches the gospel. And he also preaches from the prophet Joel. He says, And it shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons, your daughters, they will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will have dreams. And even on my male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a dangerous passage. The imagery here. It reminds us that the throne of God is not here to be buddy-buddy with you. It has peals of lightning which come out of it. When Isaiah the prophet looks at God, he is unmanned, destroyed irrevocably. God is dangerous. He alone is worthy of your fear. But you know what? He loves you more than anything else you could ever imagine. We have forgotten that God is dangerous and we thought that it would be cute to toy with evil. No. In this passage, here we find out why men and women both preach the gospel. It's not out of service. 
Not out of service to identity politics that says, oh, we want everything to look equal and all this stuff. No, no, no. It is out of rejection of that. All, all men and women, all sons of Adam can once again, all daughters of Eve can once again stand firm sufficiently. Just and whole creatures, they can come back to their maker and stand with him on that day of evil. Paul gives us encouragement in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And guess what? By the fires of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit will strengthen you. You should never fear defeat by evil. Contend for the gospel, lest the lost be eaten by chaos. Holiness is a beautiful thing. It's the antidote to the chaos in the world. If we in the church preach, you know, you're perfect like you are, then we've thrown away holiness. There's no rational thought. There's just the void in Genesis 1-2. There's nothing. Holiness is beautiful. It rejects a lot of things, actually. And by the grace and mercy of God, it rejects them because we want to live in a world without them. Let us close with John's words in 1 John 5, 1-15. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments, for the love of God is this, that we obey His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's close by saying the Lord's Prayer, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. God love you, and have a blessed day.